of history, to watch it through history. Okay, and since we don't have that, I started to look for spatial data. And I found one example only, low and high F, uh, in two African lagoons. And basically, the data's not good, but I'm, re I'm reaching here. <laughs> but they do say this, and I thought this was interesting. I, I stole some quotes from them. Persistence of high yields can probably be explained by the rejuvenation of fish whose average length reduced from 19 to 12 centimeters. At the same time, we have a loss of diversity, sorry, at the same time numbers be representing 83% of the total catches went from 11 to 6, another loss of diversity. And finally, an interesting quote, is heavy fishing was followed by the reorganization of the species assembled to exploitation produced only a few dominant species for which average catches were small, which were generally herbivorous, in other words, low, and exhibited a continuous reproduction, which is what we'd argue, you know, the argument just pumping over, right? And sometimes lowering the age of first sexual genetic, permitting fast turnover. So, I guess you could say, McCann, why do you need theory? This guy already told us everything we, we need. And that's somewhat true, but I think it at, operates as a framework to start looking at how you view the world. So we're going to come back to the Tonley Sap, because this is the example that started us off. And it's funny, because when I was at the Tonley Sap, I was on this thing called a dye. And a dye fishery is basically gets migratory fish. And they put, there's whole families that run these things 24 hours a day during the migratory sort of uh, pulses. And they, they mine, they're sort of like trap nets that line across the entire river, okay? And while I was there during one of the rain season, every 15 minutes they pull in about uh, a ton of fish. And every one of them, almost to a, a T, was something tiny, okay? You get big ones here and there, but they're at the point now where you can literally see without the data that they've pushed them down to actually about five small species. And the five species, they call them tray real. Which, and actually, their dollar is named after that. It's called the real. And these tray real are sort of, uh, one of them is, the most dominant one is a, is a little carp, a little Siamese mud carp. And, you know, it just it turns over enormously fast and it dominates this catch. It's not, it's not even, it's over, overwhelming. So going through some of the other things, this system has lost almost all its top predators. There's one of my colleagues over there beside some giant barbs that were, while we were there, were swept up on shore because of a, a wind event that pushed, um, you know, low oxygen water in, huge field and they, they came floating up and you never catch these things they're virtually beyond that um, this is the tray real this is what i'm talking about this is that low level basically herbivorous herbivorous fish that's dominating 50 percent of the catch the other thing we noticed is that when i did dig some of the data up and I, I, I believe this data i don't believe the temporal data i believe the gross pattern if you actually look at the number of large fish down to small fish in terms of cpu ue this system is enormously bottom heavy it's like orders and orders of magnitude difference between the tray real and the top. So it's like, you know, Neltonian pyramid of the highest order. Um, and th there's evidence that this is highly correlated, but I don't buy this. It's, first of all, it's got an R squared of 0.9. It was done by this uh, French uh, uh, scientist who's excellent. So I don't, I'm, it's not that what I'm calling a question. It's like about eight data points. And when I've seen all the data, it's just suspicious. But anyway, that's, that's consistent with what, I'm, what we're saying, but I, I think it's dubious given the amount of data. Okay, so I'm going to end in the next five minutes on one final thing. This is my uh, master's student. So that was the end of that, and we were, sort of, we were still thinking about that. And uh, Carlin came in uh, about a year ago and said, well, McCann, there is some data that will test this, but you just have to have a different perspective. And I said, okay, what is the data? And she said, well, let's look at bottom trolls. Because in a sense, what they are is we can look at this from a subweb perspective. We could say bottom trolls, as you can see here from this uh, graph, this figure I just pulled off the internet, basically is arguing that 90% of the uh, bike, you know, fish are caught and often die. So in effect, that's an indiscriminate fishery, right? It's clearly, but it's of a certain type. It's not the whole food web. It's of the subweb. Okay, so she said, let's use that as a case example, and she started going into like, the data, and we're going to do, we're literally in the process of doing sort of your classical meta-analysis, where we're going to use the slope of this line, which I'll, I'll or tell you a bit about in a second, as sort of the effect size, but we haven't done it, so I'm only going to show you roughly where we're going. But so basically, this is from a nor the North Sea, this is an example, and basically what she's done is gone in and found where there was long time series, okay? And then what she's done is any one of those dots is a species, okay? And let's say the time series goes so far, she'll actually draw an exponential curve for, through it or log it and get the slope of that, uh, that curve, okay? And if it's negative, what does it mean? It means it's declining. And if it's positive, it means it's increasing. 
Okay, and now what she did is plot growth rate, which was also part, of either if not part of the actual study, but from other um, sources. And she's plotted about growth rate versus time series trend. And you would predict exactly this type of slope in the arrangements I just said. Why? Because the low growth species should show the greatest decline, and the fast growth species should show the uh, sort of a less decline. Now, in this case, almost all of them are in decline in this case. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, and then we all, she also did that by looking within trophic level because she should also see the same thing trading off within a trophic level too. Okay? And so this is just taking organisms of that same system but within the same uh, trophic level and looked at it that way. All right? And then we've had to do it in different ways. She, there's some cases where we don't have growth rates or body size but we have trophic level and these are all the different examples and you can use the same sort of uh, statistical approach. And what we're here, you'd expect the slope going the opposite direction if, if, if it followed the predictions. Okay, so of all these cases so far, we've got about 14, and 13 and 14 all show very strong responses to this um, in the way that, that would be predicted. Okay, so I'm going to end there um, <clears throat> to summarize. Basically, we're sort of introduced sort of a continuum of rural fisheries types, from selective right down to indiscriminate, and we've argued that basically, if you start looking at this, you expect sort of different answers out of this. Okay, and it might be a useful thing to sort of go forward thinking about this. There's currently this thing called balanced fisheries. I don't know if any of you heard of this, and this is related to sort of the indiscriminate fishery, but they argue they fish everything at their, pro uh, their, their productivity. It's dubious in my opinion, not because it's not beautiful if it could be done, but it's imp almost impossible. The, the actual ability to actually harvest something at its productivity is astoundingly tricky. Not to mention that once you do that, the feedbacks and pathways through it change the productivity. It would be an extremely hard thing to do. And so while it's being put out there, and it sounds wonderful, I, I'm not sure how we would do that. Having said that, that would fit on this continuum. But basically what I showed you is that when you're an indiscriminate fishery, it, it ought to sort of create these highly productive agro-ecosystems almost by mistake. Okay? And that these highly productive agro ecosystems should be extremely sustainable relative to selective from a community perspective, a community of fish. But that they would be really, really unstable in a whole bunch of other ways. Right? They're, they often respond dramatically and rapidly to changing environmental conditions, both positive and negative. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that make them you know, potentially extremely dangerous despite the enhanced sort of productivity of this um, productive monoculture effect. Uh, and the final thing I just want to say one more time is that these systems do need to be studied better. There's millions and millions of people um, surviving off them. And yet the data is just absolutely treacherous, as you've seen from my attempt to piece things together to make a statement. But we're over there uh, doing, doing work, but there's very little in that system. And I'm sure that the problem's epidemic uh, in other places where, where you know, such fisheries are a grave risk of, of sort of anthropocentric change. And I guess I'll leave it at that and take some questions.